Hello and welcome to the recordproduction.com interview. I'm here with Mark Rankin. Hi. So Mark is a multi-Grammy winning engineer and producer and was originally hailing from the UK and now lives in LA. So Mark, do you mind, uh, let's go back to your beginnings. I, uh, yes. I did read that in the 90s, you actually first started out with a sampler, which was your first foray into actually making music and selling it. It was indeed, yeah. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I started, I think the first thing I ever bought, just to show how amateur I was, was a Korg Prophecy. <laughs> yeah. Remember when those synths came out and it was like, this thing is like a virtual analog synth. Sure. I remember reading about it in Sound on Sound or whatever and then going, I have to have that. And I remember I bought it. I waited weeks. You know, you'd be phoning the store and they're like, yeah, it's still in customs. We're waiting. It's just like, oh. Yeah, before then, the time of internet shopping. Exactly, yeah, up, yeah. Like, you have to go updates. to the store and they'd be like, yeah. it's come in. And you go down to the store and pick it up. And then I remember getting it home and for like a week after just being like, I can't, as soon as I changed the MIDI channel, the sound changes. I didn't realize it was a monophonic, like it was a monophonic synth. And I <laughs> thought it was going to be like this. I'd literally phone the store and be like, um, I think it's broken because I can't, you know, yeah. So yeah. that's literally where <laughs> I started, yeah. And I was like, oh, right, yeah, I need a sampler. That, yeah. It's that kind of typical me, it's like just, just get something and go, okay. Uh, how do I work this then? You know, I did very much the same. Typical. My first little eight channel mixer. <laughs> yeah. How do I get it into the computer on yeah, the same machine? Open now, the box. Like, Manual. Don't need that. Yeah. What uh, do you mean? It's only stereo output. <laughs> I want to record eight channels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had this. I had this shiny call prophecy, and then I bought like a second hand Akai S one thousand, and that was the start. And I think I had this like little Roland dance sound module, and yeah, Cubase on a Mac. I bought like a cheap Mac at some point and had Cubase on there and that was, yeah. And then I sort of just got involved sure. and started, started making stuff, you know. That's the way to do it. I was really into, uh, I, I kind of grew up with a lot of electronic music when I was a kid, you know, like when I was really young, electro and hip hop came out and it was just like, whoa, this stuff is like, this sounds like the future. So like, how can I do that robot voice thing? Yeah. You know? And it's that inquisitive nature that usually draws people into the Yeah, and you're like, you see people with samplers making hip-hop records, you're like, oh, it's just like hitting yeah. things and the sound's coming out. It's not like, oh, I like that. It's just like, how? Why? Yeah, yeah. must do. Yeah, I want me to sound <laughs> like that. Need, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, me and a few friends, you know, we would sort of all be like be get getting this equipment and, and just trying to make stuff and learn that way, you know, and in the end that we sort of, um, we just make these little dance tracks and kind of, you would go and, get them pressed up. Yeah, you sure. know, we get 500 copies pressed up and then go and try and sell them at record shops. And so, <laughs> you know, industry. Your own label immediately. Which I was thinking the other day, it's kind of like back to that now with Spotify and people become independent. Yeah. You can like, you don't even have to go and get records pressed now. You can just do that and... Just self-release? Sell it that way, you know, self-release stuff. It's yeah. It's great industry. Well, uh, you know, the record industry is booming again. Yeah. Like vinyl, I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of back to that. You're like, man, you can do that. Yeah. You'll right. be digging out your cassettes soon. <laughs> exactly, going over all the old material. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. was all of it self-taught then, or did you go and study afterwards? I went, or? so I did that for, you know, a few years, and not, I was at, living at home and annoying my parents, you know, with a massive set of speakers upstairs, <laughs> sure. and, and my dad would be shouting. And then after a while, I kind of was like, I remember reading the, <clears throat> you know, obviously I was an avid reader of, like, magazines and all these music production magazines. I remember seeing the thing about Spike Stent and like he was like this interview, I think it was in Sound on Sound or something and he was like stood over this SSL and, and I just read the list of what he'd done and been like, oh, it's him, yeah. you know, and it's like, how do I do that? So then I went to, I signed up for a night course at college, like a city and guild in sound engineering at City of Westminster College sure. and I, I was living in Essex, at my parents at the time, like kind of half an hour, 40 minutes outside of London. Yep. So to, to sort of support this, I would go and do like construction jobs in the day, get up at like 6 a.m., go and do this work all day and then go to college at night in Paddington. Oh, wow. And then go home, you know, and there's like from 40 people, I think, probably about 40 people who started this course. Two years later, there were like five of us finished it. Yeah, I remember that. I was, like, I was yeah. the same. <laughs> I did it. I did it. Yeah. And then, yeah, after that, I did the usual thing where you send out CVs or your resume, you know, to studios and I remember I didn't 
I was only sending it out to recording studios, but I accidentally sent one to the Exchange Mastering Studio <laughs> as well. Yeah. And they were the only people who got back to me. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, and they, they called me and they said, oh, do you want to come in? I was like, oh, my God. It was like an actual recording studio. I didn't, yeah, it turns out it wasn't. <laughs> but, <laughs> Mastering um, suite. But, yeah, I went, I went there and they gave me a job as a runner. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Just like going, going and getting lunch and logging tapes and stuff like that. So did you end Classic up... Classic kind of studio start. Yeah. You know? Did you end up uh, falling in love with the mastering side or were you always erring on the engineering? I was always side? erring on the engine. I always wanted to get behind an SSL. Yeah. Here we are yeah, today. I made it. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, but then discovering that world as well was really cool, like learning to cut records. And the exchange was a massive mastering studio at that point. They were kind of like one of the centers of um, the industry, you know, yeah, sure. big electronic music scene at that time and in the UK. And so they were cutting records for like Bjork and Massive oh, wow. Attack and Chemical Brothers and all these people, yeah, you know, Daft Punk player. and all the French house stuff was done there. The Americans, like Roger Sanchez and everyone would come in there. So yeah, had all these people coming through there, which was music I loved and listened to. So it was a great experience, you know, and then I was learning to cut records. Amazing. At the same time, just yeah. like hanging out at the end, you know, my hours were 10 to 6 and at the end of it I would stay and just like sit in if someone was unattended or, or whatever, just sit there and listen, <laughs> yeah. you know, just watch. Just absorb like a <laughs> just sponge. Just sit there quietly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was great. Yeah, brilliant. So, yeah, I guess the, the, the moving on point from there was that I did want to go and do recording. Mm. You know, I was like, I did that for probably a couple of years. And I was like, I really want to go and think I'm going to move on and go and try and find a job in the studio. And so Graham Durham, who was the owner there, was like, well, why don't we build a studio? Because he was like a massive, sure. um, you know, he was just an audiophile guy. He was just obsessed with equipment. And you'd just come off working on construction sites then, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I'd been, yeah, I'd like managed to give, you know, got, I gave that up, I had this job. And so I was like, yeah, I, I had experience. My, fam, my, my dad was a builder. It's kind of, that was where I came from, oh, you perfect. know, this sort of working class part of, East London. So, yeah, he was like, we had this other unit. And um, he was like, let's, uh, let's just clear it out and we'll build a studio. He wanted to build this, like, hi-fi studio, you know. They were always obsessed. Obviously, they were obsessed with sound. So we did that. And we had a builder come in. And me and the builder actually, like, poured a concrete floor and oh. built this <laughs> concrete floating room in there. Well, you know, we obviously got help with the calculations for, for like an acoustic of specialist to get the kind of right weight distribution and stuff on the floor. Yeah, and we built the studio in there and sort of kitted it out. I got, I, it was the days of like eBay was first up and running. And I would sit up, I would like go into the studio at like 4 a.m. Yeah. sometimes just to catch an auction that was ending in America because you had to like manually oh, do it at that yeah. point. There's no auto bid. And yeah, no, I got lucky. You, you know, I'd pick up all these vintage mics and stuff for like, 400 quid or something yeah. like these really cool Those bargains you don't hear about now totally like rca ribbon mics and stuff like that you know when it yeah. was like still i know of someone who got still a pair of coals for 300 dollars because yeah someone said they were a bit old and dull yeah <laughs> crappy yeah that's what i'm looking for coals yeah yeah yes loads of things like that so, so you yeah. literally you wanted to work in a studio and you literally built the studio i literally built the studio yeah i i mean you know i think some this i was so lucky just to be to be given that opportunity. Of course. And then when it was built, I got put in there to, it's like, okay, get on with it then, you know. And is is that the place, I've heard a rumour that you built the console from an old antique wardrobe? It was, yeah. Is that correct? So, yeah, you would get in the exchange, you would have audio files, because Graham was an audio file, you'd have all these people come in and be like, you know, people that were sort of dealers and whatever, and they'd be like, I've got all this stuff, you've got to check this out. And there's this one guy called Ricky, I forget his surname if he's out there. Sorry, Ricky. But he had got a load of stuff from the BBC. Sure. Again, he was like obsessed with stuff in the 50s when they built things properly, you know. So he came in and he had all of these like paint and pots, which was what they used to use at the BBC, which was huge, what about three inch um, diameter or something, silver contact pots, super high quality. And we had loads of these things. So we basically like learned to test them see what all they they all did and i built we built a mixer we got this plan drawn up the guy who makes broadhouse gardens equipment now in the uk he's oh, an yeah. ex-deco engineer he used to do all the maintenance there so he drew us up this simple plan of building a super simple mixer which was like a level pot and a pan pot and that was it 
Right. And so Graham That's was all you obs- need sometimes. It's all you need. So Graham was obsessed with this, you know, all things that are made properly. So we went and bought like a walnut wardrobe from an antique store and took the door off of it. So we had this big like slab of walnut and he's 16, 16 channel, yeah. So like 16 level pots. parts. Bought like, big like chicken head yeah. knobs, you know. Wasn't like super, probably looked a bit out of proportion. We couldn't find <laughs> big ones. We had these chicken head knobs because it was fairly retro. 16 level and 16 pan pot things, and that was it. That was the mixer, yeah. That's incredible. And it was hardwired to the tape machine. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> it was like, I would have, we'd buy mics, mostly ribbon mics. I had all these old, old tech and RCA ribbon mics. We had, we, again, I don't know how I found this stuff, but we had something like eight V76s, Telefunk and V76s, incredible. and at least 16 V72s. That I just scoured from the internet and found, and people. Yeah, what an eBay fund, right? <laughs> I was like, so we had all this stuff. So we had they were the preamps. I would like put a ribbon microphone in front of you know on the drums or whatever, on in front of guitars. That would go into one of the pre's, and then that would go into an EQ if we wanted to EQ it, like a nineteen inch, usually like an EAR or a RCA EQ. Sure. Into there, out of there, into the back, physically into the back of the Studio A80 16 track tape machine two inch and then out of there into the mixer yeah amazing <laughs> literally just like i'm gonna plug it in i'll go around the back of the tape machine and like i think i used to have dreams just about this avalanche of cables that was yeah. just hanging around there, so you, you know? no patch bay or anything no patch bay because that wouldn't be audio file yeah, yeah. i mean everything was like xlr straight, straight yeah, direct connections back. direct connection i remember yeah. the first time i saw a patch bay as well i thought a couple of grand for a bunch of holes? Like, what does this <laughs> even do? You know? yeah. Before I'd even, yeah, learned anything about it. Yeah. That, that thing of like when you got the sampler. How does that work? Yeah. Like, why would you want a bunch of holes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah directly and after a while, you're like, oh, yeah, patch bay. That's a good idea. Yeah, it makes you sense. Know, you can just like, wish someone had thought of that. <laughs> oh, they have. Oh, you mean that's a thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you basically became head engineer of your own studio on From the nothing. back of, yeah, basically coming out <laughs> From of college college yeah. and then watching over some mastering <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. was were you using techniques you'd learned in college or I was is just, this you yeah but, just yeah. kind of trying things out i was obsessed yeah so i would read about everything and what how everybody did things and you'd have people come into the exchange who were cutting records and i'd be talking to them you know and then it'd be so many different kind of schools of thought and aspect and i'd just be like so while I was standing there making them coffee, be like, so, um, yeah, that kicks what out. did you do? Yeah. yeah, yeah, just like milking everybody. Of course. You know, and you go next door and try it. Using the resource. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I was just like, oh, yeah, I've read about this guy who did that. So I'd try that and then find out, you know, how that worked or didn't work. And, yeah, it was total, like, learn on the job. Amazing. Yeah. So the first job I did in there was for Basement Jacks. Oh, wow. Yeah. I remember being That's so good. nervous. And <laughs> I would be like... Yeah, I've got to record drums for Bass and Jacks tomorrow. Yeah. Ooh. And I guess it was a pretty... I think I even had to rent some mics because everything was vintage and, and they kind of didn't quite want that. Mm. We even had to rent some mics in, but, you know, it's probably a pretty basic drum setup at that it's point. It's not a bad first gig, though. It's not a bad first gig, yeah. Yeah, so that so, was it. They had this kind of clientele that were coming in and mostly it was a lot of electronic music. So they were like, oh, you've got a recording studio next door. We want to record some drums, you know. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, how do you that? funnel that from being an electronic style mastering suite into <clears throat> clients yeah. coming into an analog I, vintage studio? I think I, I think I know what it was, which is at the time, I think the Neptunes and Justin Timberlake released that song, which I think was called Like I Love You or something, which had this really banging drum beat on it. Yeah. And I remember that was like quite in music at the time, that was like, whoa, you heard the drums on that track. You know, and I think that was part of it where people were hearing that and being like, we need to do that. We need drums. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, you're like, well, look like, what I'm providing. Oh, look, yeah, we've got a studio just there. So, yeah, that was the kind of turning point, I think. So, yeah, you funneled your own clients into the other room. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, which was great. Yeah. Perfect. And lots of people come. So, yeah, it was, which was cool. You have people like producers and engineers who did record music and, and they would be mastering things. You'd be like, oh, I've got a studio next door. And I'd be like, oh, and come and have a look, you know. I remember Jack White came in one day because he was mastering his record. Oh, wow. So I had Jack White in there. You know, he's obviously into old gear. And so he'd be like... Yeah, more quirky got. nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. Check out our console. It's yeah. a wardrobe. We had a nice Slingerland drum kit in there because people, like I said, people who would bring the things, I think that was Ricky's, the guy who brought the pots in. 
they would be like, I've got a Slingerland drum kit sitting in storage if you want to put it in the studio. Yeah, that's an amazing thing like, about studios. They yeah, attract gear. They attract yeah. gear because people are like, it's you know, probably getting damp somewhere. Mm. So yeah, I remember that was a good thing. Jack White came in there's this old Slingerland kit. You know, he's like, oh yeah, I've got one of these. Perfect. So it was like, <laughs> yeah. That's the vibe so well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was great. So it's a really good, it's so good for meeting, you know, being in studios is where you meet people mm. and how you get jobs, you know. Yeah, of course. That's what I always say about how do you get a job? It's kind of, yeah, you have to go to college or get some degree of knowledge, obviously enthusiasm and, and, you know, knowledge, but it's just meeting people after that. Meeting people and the right attitude. And the right attitude, yeah. yeah. As you said, you were the one making to... tea and coffee and exactly, yeah. quizzing them on the side. Yeah, exactly. Not being like, yeah, I've got some songs, do you want to hear them? Yeah. You know, which is, <laughs> you're like, uh, no, two <laughs> shooters. Yeah. Two yeah. uh, shooters. <laughs> so, when you were in there, you had your basement jacks sort of session, more of the analog stuff sort of coming in. Yeah. Uh, was it from there that you met uh, Paul Lipworth, I believe? As yeah, well? it was. Yeah, Paul came in. He was in a band called Lomax. And he came in, I think he'd done like a cover of a Smith song for an NME album or something like that. And he came in and we recorded that. And then mm-hmm. shortly after that, he got his, because he, uh, he was an engineer at another studio, a studio in Brick Lane that he was an engineer at. And then shortly after that, he got his first production job for the Future Heads. So he brought that in there and I did that. Yeah, so that was how we met. Right. And then after that, he got Block Party, which he brought in there, which I worked on as well. And then, um, yeah, that was the start of me working with Paul. Sure. So how was that transition going from Chemical Brothers and Daft Punk and that sort of era to Future Heads and Block Party? Yeah. Which is quite a different step. And especially how you're come out of college and we're just in there now like yeah totally yeah. How, yeah how was that change for you um i don't know i mean it was kind of like there was a bit of crossover there future heads maybe not so much but block party was there was a good bit of processing going on there you know mm. paul was like paul's a, a among other things songwriter producer he's a great engineer so i learned a lot from him sure you know i was pretty green but i guess he kind of saw that i had this sort of hunger for sound and you know yeah so the right way to do he things. invested in you trained you yeah, yeah basically yeah yeah so so he you know he had his plan of what he was doing and i guess what i brought along or something sort of contributed a bit you know and helped out so yeah i learned a lot sure and you'd stay with them for a fair few years then yeah what happened was after that we um <clears throat> so the exchange studio worked out and it was really good. It got really busy. We bought a Pro Tools rig because people were like, oh, I've had Pro Tools, we come and use it. So they're like, hey, we bought a Pro Tools rig. It started slipping from the vintage <laughs> analog thing a bit and just got it to working facility, you know. Yeah. And then bought an actual mixing desk because people wanted to do more. So we bought this MCI console, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> which is great. I love that desk. Mark Ronson now owns that exact desk. He bought oh, wow. it. Yeah, I sold it to someone else because it was just sat in storage. Um, the reason it was sat in storage was because yeah so the exchange the studio worked and then we, we gradually expanded it and then we started getting noise complaints mm. after like a couple of years it was kind of it was like residents in the building somewhere and whatever happened I don't know if it was just someone moved in who wasn't as tolerable as tolerant as the last person um, but yeah we basically had to shut it down <laughs> move yeah. out yeah so um yeah, I had sold, like, uh, me and my wife had just sold a flat that we lived in. So I had this money, and we got to a situation where we had to close studio. So I offered Graham some money for the equipment. I was like, there's a check. And he, and he kind of was like, all right. And he let me take most of the equipment out of there for this amount of money, which was great. So I basically bought the studio. And then um, at that point, Ben Hillier was setting up his new studio which was in my loco at the pool he was it was at the time it was just a big kind of sound stage room at the back but so ben took it over and turned it into this huge just sort of one room studio it's like my room was a one room studio you know there was no separate control rooms like, yeah. that's how i work and my wife was working at my loco at the time she was um the manager over there so i got talking to ben and then, so i moved all of my equipment in to the pool and started working out of there, you know. So that was a stroke of luck at the same time. Yeah. So, Back yeah, one day time. I was, yeah, I was in the pool working and then Paul came in 
And he's like, oh, I haven't seen you for ages. You've been off, you know, doing other things. And, and uh, he said, I'm looking for an engineer. I was like, huh, great. So, yeah, I, that's, uh, I bumped into Paul there mm-hmm. again. And then that, he said, I've got to do this record for Kate Nash. So uh, I need an engineer for it. I was like, great. So I went and did that. Brilliant. Um, and that worked out well. It went to number one. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, which is all right. So, yeah, that was uh, the sort of the start of m- me and Paul working to, you know, me working for Paul and working through that time. And, yeah. It's an amazingly diverse discography. You know, it's like Kate Nash. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I know later on you went with uh, like a bit of, Dizzy Rascal and CeeLo Green, if I'm not That's mistaken. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know, and then Adele as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, with like Kate Nash going number one and Adele and those sort of things. Yeah. How is it now looking back on those sessions where there are some songs that you've been in their engineering, which are now worldwide anthems? Yeah. And, you know, almost every person in the Western world knows those songs. Yeah. I mean, are you ever out at lunch and you just hear that come on in the background are you completely objective to it now or do you still hear like oh that kick drum i should have done that or <laughs> no how, I've, how's I've, that experience sometimes anyway? yeah i guess you do there's always like mm. but i've kind of learned to just go oh yeah no it's actually all right you know because <laughs> what happens is after i finish a record i generally won't listen to it for at least a year all right yeah i've just got the six month rule because yeah. of that yeah because you're like oh damn it i just didn't get that eq on that thing so I just don't, <laughs> I don't listen yeah. to them. I mean, for those who don't um, produce an engineer, they won't understand. But, yeah. you know, you need that time away from it. So it just becomes a song. So you're a listener. Again. Exactly. Yeah. After listening to something, you know, intently for sometimes months. You know, like, Agonizing over little things. People I'm going to yeah. give that a miss for a little while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't listen to it for a while or a year. Um, so, yeah, then I'll be out somewhere and you'll hear it come on. And you're like, what? oh, yeah, I did yeah. that. That's all right. It's you something know. familiar about that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds all right. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of, um, yeah, tend to have a bit of a break after I finish working on stuff. Yeah, sure. Know, before you can actually hear it and then you listen to it and you go, ah, ah it's all right. Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> you you engineered Rolling in the Deep. Um, yes. And yeah. So, you know, we look back at that. That's a massive number one everywhere. Yeah. You imagine that was, you know, done in a massive studio over X amount of months and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, how was that recorded? What was that? That's a classic tale of um, amazing singer, amazing song, you know, yeah. amazing vibe. I think that was started. It was a writing session that Paul and Adele did in in Paul's old studio, which was like probably I'm not exaggerating when I say like six foot, maybe maybe more than that, seven foot by I don't know, maybe fifteen foot. It was basically a shed, like an add-on shed in the East Coast Studios complex. Sure. And he had that room and he had a drum kit in the corner, an upright piano, sofa, and a kind of work surface with the computers and stuff on it, you know. Um, and yeah, he did a writing session with her and it was pretty much recorded in <laughs> within that writing session. He basically did the session. Adele's vocals were sung in that session and I, everything stayed and then rick rubin was producing the record sure. so we we kind of did these it's only like a week we did like four songs or something that they turned out in a week a few days a week and then adele went off and you know went to make the record with rick rubin and then it came back you know they were like she they sort of finished it and i remember her being like oh, it's not it kind of feels like it's not the same or you know and then yeah we got tasked with finishing it off because oh, they wow. liked the original vibe cool so a lot of the original stuff that was recorded in that room stayed. The vocals, you know, Brilliant. which was sung with her sitting on a sofa <laughs> behind with a dog, probably a dog on her lap. Incredible. As well. And, and literally, you know, it's like been a... Um... It was a writing session. I remember her, one of the songs I remember her was just going, looking at her pad and being like, okay, I think I've got something. <laughs> Let's try it. And like sang it, pulled the mic around, sang it twice. And then I remember her saying, shall I do another one? And then <laughs> yeah. you going... No, no, I think we're good. Yeah. Wow. Like maybe replacing, you know, taking two words from one take and putting them into another. Yeah. That was it. And that, it was like, ooh. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. And you can hear that. I think that's why it came, you know. Yeah. I mean, it does have such raw emotion in all those recordings. Yeah. It yeah. has been a topic I've discussed with people in the past. Do you actually remember what the the vocal recording chain was on there? <clears throat> yeah, I do. It was a Rode mic. 
I can always Paul had this road mic, you know, condenser mic. Sure. Brownish power supply. I don't know oh, the yeah. road that tube much. Tube one, I think. It's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, tube road mic. And it was that into one of um, those UAD, Universal Audio 6176, oh, yeah. the channels with a preamp and a 1176. In yeah. That was it. Incredible. Yeah. Just a small writing room in East London, small right? Small writing room in West London. Oh, West London, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Labrook Grove, over that way. Amazing. And that was it, yeah. And I remember I found the session recently and I was looking through it. And what was really good about the session was we committed lots of things. Like, I'm not sure. I think it stayed to the end. It definitely stayed on our session, but the vocal reverb was like a uh, Roland Chorus Echo Spring. That was the sound on that. Yeah, sure. printed, printed at the time. Yeah, the BVs were printed. Uh, it was Adele singing, and I would print them down, sometimes just through the space echo, you know. So I'm looking through it, and it's a really simple session. Drums, sure. piano. Yeah, it sounds legit stick. just from you the... See, just yeah, from you see things come in, the BVs come in, the stomps and the claps. It's great. Oh, so you know? good. It was like, yeah. It's good to reflect bit. on that so well as well. Look at it be like, yeah, you know, we just... <laughs> yeah. We did it in the engineering. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And we re-recorded, I remember... Um, yeah, going. We we so when it came back, we went to Eastcote, which was the complex we were in. Mm -hmm. We went next door to the actual studio, which was uh, the Eastcote studio, which Philip had there for years, and, and re-recorded some drums, and and we did this thing where Paul had this idea of like having a Neumann dummy head in the room, and then having everybody around the head. So we had the piano was on the left, and drums were in front and bass was over there and then anything we were going to re-record we would take the dummy head so you get this sense of space on there you know you want it to sound quite like a good room yeah sure so yeah that was part of the sound of that was when we tracked the drums we had leo play the drums uh, leo taylor was a drummer on that which was also another big part of it yeah um and we had the drum kit in front and we would record the dummy head and then when we tracked the piano that was to the left the head didn't move, you know, so you oh, had this yeah. sense of like the ambience. So it's genuine coming space across. coming in there. Yeah, yeah, which is great. It's incredible. Yeah. A brilliant way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, it was a great idea, you know. And so, we sort of added a few mics and got it pretty banging, you know. And so looking on, back on that as well, that has now become a, you know, in, awarded to you as well, a Grammy nominated and winning. Yeah. Record. Nice to get that out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. How, did, how was that becoming a Grammy winning engineer? It was, yeah, I mean, that's like the, every engineer's dream, right? Yeah, it's cool. like, that's the big one. Yeah. So, what's funny it... about that is I've, <laughs> I never got to experience it because my son was born on the same day as the Grammys, <laughs> which was obviously a very lucky day. Yeah. Um, I remember, yeah, my wife was pregnant and then he was due to be born the following week. So I had flights and everything booked, so I'm going to the Grammys, you know, got everything ready. And then she, they wanted to bring the birth forward. I remember the sweet to the midwife and saying, so wait, how, how far forward? And she was like, uh, Sunday. Because <laughs> oh, like, the Grammys is on the Sunday. And yeah. I was like, yeah, she goes, she, so she went, why? I said, um, I did this, uh, so I'm a recording engineer and I recorded Adele this time. And she's, she was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. No, we're going to do it on Sunday. <laughs> oh. So yeah, being like in, my wife was in labour all night and like watching yeah, you know, and you I think I woke up in the morning shell shocked because you know you've been through childbirth. Well, I hadn't been through childbirth, <laughs> yeah. but I experienced it. Witnessed. You were now a father. So uh, yeah, yeah. It was actually yeah, number child number three. Ah, yes. But so I've been there before, but it's nonetheless never that. Uh, it's always traumatic. <laughs> yeah. And then waking up and then seeing these messages, you know, that we won. So it's it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the ultimate high. Watching the crew on TV. And be like, <sighs> <sighs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a, did you at least dress up in your tux? <laughs> no, you know, I should have, the birth I should have worn it, shouldn't I? That would have been great. Why did I think of that? Yeah. Yeah, that would have been. Yeah, full formal dress around the hospital? <laughs> yeah, that would have been cool. And did that affect um, like your clientele coming in or your reputation? Like, it, I mean, yeah, as soon always, as you've got that Grammy tech, always what helps. Happens? Yeah, yeah. It definitely always gives you a bit of weight and people are like, oh, okay, you've done something. Yeah. Um, and it was funny enough, off the back of that, not necessarily the Grammy, but off the back of that, I got the Queens of the Stone Age gig because they contacted me. Because Josh had been here and oh, some yeah. things I did, like uh, uh, you know, the Rolling in the Deep and some Florence stuff. And he looked and it was me. And he loved the story of that the Adele sessions went to Rick Rubin, and then they couldn't beat. <laughs> they couldn't yeah, beat it. so this guy. 
It's like when you win a spec match. Came back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and came back. So they kind of they got me. Uh, yeah, I got this cool one that I was working in my studio in Hornsey. I had this little production room in Hornsey, and literally get an email from Kristen, their manager, one night. You know, being like, "Would you be interested in coming to LA to work with Queens of Stone Age?" Like, <laughs> uh, yes, I would. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I got that one. Yeah. So that's so what the prompted the move that. to come here. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I came out here and did that. Came out for a three-week trial to do that and ended up staying for seven months. Wow. Is that, that was yeah. a long one. Yeah. I mean, how far into it, you having another newborn was this? Or did the family come as well? The family came. It was in no, the I summer. So the kids were off and we were like, Let's, you know, I'm going to go out there. Well, you might as well come out there and just spend a bit of the summer out there, you know. Mm. I'd be working. But um, so, yeah, they came out for a bit, still with young kids. But they came out there for a while and then we were like we came out because we had three kids at the time and we came from london to la and we're like wow this is really good it's like sun is out all the time yeah. and you can uh, drive places when you know, you've got kids i lived in north london before that and you'd have to park three streets away from your house you know because of the parking yeah, and of stuff and then you go out and be like i think i can't be bothered to move the car because i'm gonna have to park it in the next yeah. village basically so i've got a prime back. spot i'll never move the car i'm never gonna move it you'd be walking past your car being like yeah i've got a good spot there i'm gonna yeah. go get the bus <laughs> um yeah coming here and being like wow you can like drive places and it was easy and the weather was good and they got amazing studios and amazing scene you know so yeah we sort of thought maybe we'd come and live out here for a bit and try that so that was a kind of that was the first taster you know? sure so. And it's like, what, five years into the trial period, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Still here. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah, it's great. I love working out here. Great studios, you know. Yeah. Uh, climate helps. Um, and, yeah. yeah. And, you know, me being from New Zealand, you being from the UK, it's, it's often like, oh, yeah, the weather's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's just not a conversation there. <laughs> no, it's always know, good. Yeah. Nice weather today. Like, yeah. Yeah, people nice. look at you funny when you say that. Yeah. I'm like, of course. It's just every day. Yeah, you just comment like, I saw a cloud yesterday. <laughs> yeah, we need rain. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I've kind of been here that long now that I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to rain tomorrow. Yeah. I kind of like it. Remember when it. I think it was four months into me being here when I felt the first drips of rain. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. this is amazing. What is that? Yeah, just a little sprinkle. Someone's just spilt their Fiji water somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you came out here, uh, was it pretty much exclusively to work with Queens of the Stone Age and Josh? Or? Well, I've been planning it for a few years and, uh, and you know, I kind of thought I'm going to wait and get a, until I get a job there so we can go and start and try yeah, as usual, I didn't kind of really plan anything. It's like, there, we're going to, let's yeah, go. Now. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I got, Josh called me and said, oh, we're going to do this record with Iggy Pop. Um, we're going to go out to Joshua Tree and do it there. Yes. Like, okay. This is what I've been waiting for. So, <laughs> yeah. Going from London to the <laughs> desert as well. <laughs> to the <laughs> desert, yeah. Yeah, so we came out, uh, literally like six suitcases or something, me and the whole family, put them into an apartment thing in LA and was like, I'll be back. Went to the desert. Yeah. So that was great. That was amazing. What an yeah. initiation. Yeah, yeah. Like, here you are. Um, yeah, so we went out to Joshua Tree, to Rancho, uh, out there where Josh works and is yeah. sort of uh, one of his spots, you know. And it's an amazing place anyway, if you're not going to go near a studio, but to work out there is it's crazy. It's, yeah, a bit mystical. It's yeah, I've been wanting to check out a few other studios out there. Yeah, so this place, it's, Dave Catching's place, is Rancho. Yeah, and it's out in Joshua Tree, and it's it's basically you know you come off the highway and you you're in the desert, you're driving through sand, and you go up and they have this big kind of compound, and there's a house where the studio is, and then there's they have a sort of a, it's a real it's basically like a compound. There's another house further up, which is Brian O'Connor's house, which is BOC, who's the bass player from Eagles of Death Metal. Sure, yeah, and then at the back there's Hutch, who's Josh's sound you know live sound man for years. And then they have various outbuildings and things. So it's like this big compound and they've built a big motorcycle track that goes around the whole thing. Oh, so oh. it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You, got, you sort of go and work in the studio. And then we were sort of, Hutch had a house further up that we were having dinner in. So we'd What work. a compound. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and you walk, as you, so we'd finish at like five or six for dinner. Mm. And walk up to the other house to eat and there, there's like, you know, you go past the thing where there's a log with some throwing axes yeah. and then there's a station with some BB guns, you know, and then motorbikes just yeah, kicking take around. Yeah, a bit of place. dinner and, and then I'm going to take a bike. Yeah, yeah, and then we'd ride up there. So, yeah, it's great. And, and then so, uh, Iggy Pop in the mix. Is, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
It's amazing. And that would have been one one hell of a session to start off with, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was great. You so, know. So you'll work with uh, Josh and Queens of the Stone Age and Iggy Pop. I mean, Queens of the Stone Age are known for having a rather distinctive sort of sound on a lot of their records. And, yeah. And not really so generic, so yeah. to speak. Had your history of you kind of reading about it and making up techniques and using an odd console that you guys had built, had that all played into his desire to take you on as an engineer or did you learn quite a lot on those sessions about yeah, the sounds no. they want to get? Yeah, for How sure, yeah. Come? I learned a lot. I mean, it's one of those things. I don't think he, he had sort of researched me that much. You know, he'd just been like, I like the sound of that. Let's get the guy who did that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I remember coming to Josh's studio in L.A., um, and yeah, walking, you know, walking in, and there's Queens of Stone Age there. And it's like, right, let's get on with it. And I was thinking, okay, look, oh, I think all you can do in that situation is just you've been called there for a reason. So just do yeah, what you, you do. You do your job. Yeah, you do your job. I remember, I think it was on the first day we started and we were recording Keep Your Eyes Peeled, which is the first song on the record. And I remember being like I remember the drum he had a drum tech here Gersh and he was sort of had the drum tune I was kind of can we can we take the snare a bit lower you know it was a bit high and I, I was I was never really into like it wasn't like super high but I was never really into high rock drums that was one mm. thing I always wanted to avoid when working with the rock band was like that typical sound um and I remember sort of having this discussion with Gersh and being like you know can we go down and he was like you know you're gonna lose that thing and I remember Josh sort of coming over the PA and being like no, I like where he's going. Go lower. Just do what he says. You know, <laughs> Brilliant. And like, okay. He built you up. Yeah, he, he gave me the, you know, gave me the space. Um, yeah, so it was great. And I kind of like quite aggressive drum sounds for the most part, which he appreciated. And uh, yeah, it tend, seemed to be that we had this sort of thing in common. That we that we both like this sort of certain sure. approach to recording drums you know so yeah it's brilliant it should be a collaborative process yeah you know? for sure yeah i mean you know i mean queens is such a distinct thing yeah they have their thing and it's like how you can augment that or what you can bring into that you know without yeah and that's partly why you came on a, i guess the trial to make sure that you guys got along well for sure and, yeah yeah everything worked yeah totally yeah yeah so lucky that kind of worked out perfect <laughs> yeah so your kind of your drum recording technique what's your do you have a kind of classic you go to or are you a few mics or a million mics kind of guy? What's your... I guess your I general? have... I'm a sort of like few mics on the kit, but then maybe it will be a fair few mics with additional things. You know, I'll have sure. like... A lot of I'll, character then. A lot of character and I'll start with... Um, a lot of the time I'm like a one mic on the kick guy. You know, there's not that many... Try to avoid too many layers of stuff like that. I'm usually like yeah. one mic on the kick, looking into the hole at the front. That's usually a, a you know, Bayer Opus 65, I think they're called. Sure. Not that common. I think I'll have to look that off. Check those out. They're amazing. Um, used to be a D12, and I heard this was like, ah, it's like that with the EQ. So literally one of those, something like um, a Bayer 201 on the top of the snare, Sure. Or uh, I, for a while I went through the case, you know, you've got those modified 57s. Yes. Yeah. So like the tape on mod or something. Yeah. I would use those for a while, but the Bio 201 is great. i kind of really into those. Sure. And that's that. A lot of the time I'll be a mono overhead over the snare, which, you know, gives you a nice bit of guts and that kind of overall kit sound. And I find, you know, once you get stereo and big, you kind of lose punch you know or you start yeah. you can start getting phase more mics stuff. more phase problems it, yeah, yeah it yeah. goes on so some that's a good like straight down the middle punch you mm. know and you get that kind of weight around it and then yeah usually uh not always a hi-hat mic sometimes a hi-hat mic if you want to bring that out because you get a lot of that um and then tom mics and that's the kind of basic you know and then comes the weird stuff <laughs> you know yeah, so sure. you, can, you got that then you can dial it in or you can do something odd but then it's the other mics that give you the character for me you know which yeah. is sometimes it's like i had this really nice old rca um 6203 which is like a sort of mic this shape sure green army green thing old rca ribbon mic which i'll put if i'm the drummer 
I'll put somewhere like here or here, depending. Sometimes here you get too much hi hat, but looking at kick and snare. Yeah, and so sometimes... about rib height then. Yeah, kind of like rib kind high. Of sometimes it's like drummer head high. Sure. And if it's too too much that side, I'll move it this side. But that is like an instant, it's a great microphone for that. You get instant kind of like low mid darkness and punch, which is great for like adding in. Yeah, you know, sustain and and I guess character. you're listening to what the drummer's listening to as well. Is right that there, position? You know? Yeah, so yeah. It's how they're balancing themselves. Yeah, so that is usually a, one of the features. And then recently, I've been really into contact mics again. Ah, yes. Yeah, the seducers. I love them, <laughs> and I got a, I've got a pair of those. And what I do with those is put those on the kick and snare. That was wow. a big part of the the new Queens of the Stone Age record on Villains. Sure. Is that sound, you know, Josh had told me about his idea was to get this little vacuous sound that was odd and sort of uh, truncated, you know, short sounds that were just like. Ah, 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 ah. So I thought I kind of remember using those in the pool. Ben Hiller used to have them a lot, I think. So I remember getting a pair of those and putting those on, and then yeah, saying to Josh, oh, I've got these contact mics they're great for that sort of stuff I mean, and you sort of like I do is put one on usually on like the front hoop of the kick drum yeah so on like the front head you, they're like you know they look like a basic an Apple Watch strap yep the cable coming off the back and you put them on there a bit of double sided tape and you stick them down and they give this kind of sometimes it's a really good sound a lot of the time it's a kind of like this boxy closed down thing but if you then overdrive that and sometimes compress a lot of time you don't have to compress it with the with the distortion. Um, you get an amazing kind of like hip hop crunch, yeah. you know. So I do that, and then one on the snare. A lot of the time it's stuck on the side of the snare, or if that's you get a lot of hi hat coming in. A lot of the time, what you can do is take a microphone boom stand and I stick it onto that, mm -hmm. and then you can just like position it okay. and drop it over the top, so it's you know, looking right down onto the snare, just sneak it in. So, yeah, so you kind of use both of those and you can um, drive them and a bit of EQ and you get a kind of nasty old distorted short. Yeah. So you've been using a lot more down. drive since working with them? Or yeah, is it something so. you've always yeah, done? Something, actually, something I've always done is like overdriving things, especially drums. Yeah. Ambient mics as well. I love overdriving ambient mics because you get this kind of explosive... You know, you, there's a bit more tension in there. A bit of aggression. A bit there. of aggression, yeah. yeah. And you sneak that in and all of a sudden it's, yeah, without too much level, it's got much more kind of bang to it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's a, another favourite. And I am um, fascinated that you haven't gone for any of the cliché sort of like classic or very common things like, a, you know, a D112 on kick or yeah. 57s anywhere. I mean, how yeah. do you approach uh, bass and guitars as well then? If um are you quite yeah what's your untraditional yeah, yeah i guess i mean i've been i've done that stuff you know i used to do that They're great mics to use, I used to use yeah it. yeah d112 I've never used, i was into d12s or d25s mm -hmm. kicks then i found the bay and was like oh it's like that but with a bit of eq yeah so, and coming from a console with no eq I yeah guess exactly that's dream. yeah it's always yeah i was always into like that was part of the thing i learned when i was back in the exchange was like oh, i've realized if you move this microphone out a little bit or it changes the sound so much so that's a big part of it John that was one of the things I think that got me that kept me on the Queen session that first time was I think I didn't use an EQ for the whole I mean like in that first week yeah I don't think I used an EQ and I was like well I'm just gonna go and move the mic and I'll be like constantly it keeps me fit because I'm just literally yeah, like, running between okay, rooms just run back in there move it come back in and be like mm, yeah nearly <laughs> yeah and Josh is like Oh shit, I see, okay, he hasn't used an EQ. And then he was like, he kind of, I didn't actually realise I hadn't used an EQ, and then he was like, brought it up. Mm. So then that became a challenge, <laughs> not to use an EQ for the whole record, which I think we did. So, yeah. So, yeah it's that great thing discipline about, as an engineer like that too. Totally, you know, yeah, it's like yeah. You're just, you're getting the right sound from you, the get-go get rather the right than be like, oh, it needs more tops. Which is the thing, yeah, don't reach for the EQ straight away. And that part of it was because I was in the room, in that exchange studio, it was one room, so there was no... You're not listening through speakers. I was listening to the kit, you know. Yeah. You are on headphones, and then you listen to the kit, so you hear it, and then you kind of hear what you're getting back, and you're like, oh, okay. 
you know, then you go and move the mics. And I learned moving the mics, even with a pair of headphones on sometimes, moving the microphones changes it so much. Yeah. So just having that discipline of using microphones, you know, that's that's a big part of them. And using proximity, the placement. Yeah, using the placement and moving, and different types of mics, you know. A ribbon mic is get, you know is going to have a different sound to a dynamic or a condenser or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And picking the mic. It's not all just that. a roll off at the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that I mean, sometimes now you still go through the same process of the EQ, you know, but getting it working that source from the start kind of leads on, you know. Yeah, of course. Better, better it's great that he noticed like that as well. Yeah. 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 Apparently, see, so, yeah. Gave me the impression that I knew what I was talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which was good. Yeah, so that was um, that was a good thing for sure. Yeah, and uh, one thing listening through a lot of your your mixes, I notice your vocals are always that they just sit so perfectly on top of everything. You know, they don't sound that's good to hear. Too loud. They don't sound too <laughs> quiet. They don't sound like there's an obvious massive reverb. Right. Yeah. They just sound like they're sitting really rich and warm and with the appropriate ambience. Yeah. I think. I mean, yeah. As part of it, I was never really. I don't know. I guess time I grew up in. I was a kid in the eighties. Reverb was a massive thing. But when I started learning production, I think it wasn't so much. And it. Would, I would be. Yeah. I think it was like I was into finding the space naturally, if possible. You know. So I yeah, think sure. that carries over into. I'm kind of a big fan of just ambience and sometimes recording vocals with an ambient mic as well, you know. Yeah, like not so a lot afraid. of your ambiences are actually natural. Are actually the ambience, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whether it be no a microphone. So yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, so usually it'll be a mic. For the lead vocal, there's always a vocal mic. Yeah. And then maybe there'll be uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like a, uh, an ambient mic as well that will crank up, Sure. you know. That was a big part of uh, villains, actually. Same thing, but then when you're doing BVs, if you're ultimately if you're going to want them behind the lead, why not record them like that? You know, move the microphone, yeah, further or the away. singer further away. So yeah, sometimes I'll do that. Like I'll put a put a vocal mic up and have someone sing, but I'm actually recording an ambient mic which is cranked up or something or compressed or, you know, give yeah, it a bit. Sure. So they've got a bit of pressure to sing to. It's one useful thing I've learned actually um, about recording vocals is having a, like, it sounds really silly, but having a really great sound in the headphones. But part of that is also having compression on there is really good for singers to have that mm. pressure to sing against, you know, and to have that kind of, yeah, they can hear of, every single nuance. Yeah, of the hear that and have that sort of thing, that hand keeping, you know, keeping your toes like holding someone's head like <laughs> yeah. that while they're coming at you. Um, and that's a good thing. I kind of, I like doing that sometimes with plugins because you have like, I'll have a typical vocal compression setup when recording, which isn't too heavy, yeah. you know, whatever it might be, an 1176 or a Fairchild or something, just kind of keeping it and stopping it going crazy. But then a lot of the time I'll have a, low latency dis, um, compressor plug-in on the channel, which is basically slamming them, yeah. you know. So, so you're feeding them that. So they're that feeding them. So they're getting that, so yeah, and they can that have something to sing against. Brilliant. But you're not just going to lose the vocal performance because you totally have compressed it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is um, terrible sometimes. If it's, you know, if it goes too crazy. Yeah, of it's course. It's good for vibes sometimes. If it works, it's great. But then you can go too far. So you don't, yeah, you don't want to you lose that if you don't get to Yeah, exactly. Tape yeah. As well. So good thing, yeah, great thing about plugins these days, you can do that. Yeah, of yeah, course. And have that on the chain so they can sing against it. Um, yeah, but yeah, the vocal amp. And sometimes I, uh, I've been lucky enough to work at great studios. Like I worked at United with Iggy. And then they have such good rooms that we were mixing Iggy there. Yeah, and I checked if, it out last week, actually. I did you? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. They're amazing, yeah. So you can, things like what we were doing there, they have such a good system is that if you want something, you want the ambience, you can just feed it out into the room and record it on a pair of M50s or something. Yeah. And it instantly, you've just got this space. I know it's a plug-in now. <laughs> yeah. Just, the, I'll put uh, the plug-in on. One, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll put the plug-in on there. But yeah, recording ambience back for vocals is... Yeah. Is it, and it's and unique, it's, you know? It's different. Yeah, that's something it's not, it's a different I've ever come across too much, to be honest. 
I don't know if anyone has actually done that. Right. Free room well, drums, I but mean, not actually vocals. But, you know, Visconti used to do that thing where they had the sort of stages of microphone, you know, which is you can get in a plug-in. Everything's in a plug-in now. You yeah. can get this stuff. But were they all they were all gated, right? They were all gated, different. yeah, in different distances, yeah. Yeah, so the louder you got, it triggered more microphones. Exactly, yeah. That's so so really cool. when you sing loud, it opens up the furthest one. But just uh, unique in the sense that it's it's a room that's, you know, that you put in a mic in a room is, is not going to happen the same again. So it's that sound, you know, and your chain. So it's a kind of it's different every time. Yeah. And you can get something that's, so you, that's kind of different. Yeah. The answer is that you're actually catching the natural ambience yeah. that the vocalist was in. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, it sounds so natural. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, so you're with, you know, Queens and all the gear around here, particularly, and a few of your records. You've got some such kind of distinct and different sounds. And obviously, you know, working with Queens, you've done a, a fair bit of that. Does that come down to a lot of the gear that you've got at hand? Because I know when you showed me around, there were crazy guitar amps I'd never seen before. And <coughs> yeah. All sorts of yeah. bizarre things going on. Um, I mean, how much of it is the gear? How much of it are the techniques? How much of it, is it, of it is what you're adjusting on them? Yeah, I guess it's a combination of both, you know. Like, I mean, particularly with Queens, each band member has their thing. They have a sound, you know. A lot of, you know, I guess a lot of people do. Yeah. Queens is really distinct. There's like distinct sounds. Josh has his chains. And just their style and what they do, what they're looking for. Yeah. It's a distinct sound that he comes up with. So there's that. And then it's how you record that, you know, and your approach to that, I think. That's the kind of combination. So like sometimes it'll be a tiny in this Josh's place, he has a lot of these little film reader amps, which are what they used to use. I think for editing movies and stuff, where it's like this little, basically little speaker, sure. and it sounds like a little speaker, you know. But yeah, I, we record a lot of things like that, where you don't, you know, don't record a big amp and then try yeah. to make it sound like a little speaker. We just do it through a little speaker, you know. Exactly. And if you're worried, take a DI as well. You know, I learned a good thing from Gil Norton actually was a lot of the times I'll take just a side note. I sort of go off track quite a lot, but a lot of the times I'll record a guitar DI as well when we're recording. And then that's useful for many reasons. Like you can then take the performance, obviously, and reprocess it some other way or reamp it. But also for editing, if you're recording super distorted guitars and you've got a guitar DI, you can see where they're playing, where the notes are and everything. Whereas you haven't yep. just got this big sausage roll wave form of just like, of yeah, so that's a kind of good technique. You know, just for just making things easy for yourself is record a guitar DI. Yeah, it's just a, for it's, reference. It's for reference and for you know, for safety, you know, for like possibly wanting to reamp things, you know. And a lot of time you do that because we'll, you're pushing it. That's a good thing. It's like I was saying about the vocalist, not wanting to just smash it because that's something you can't DI. But yeah. with guitars, you can do it. And then if you found out you've gone too far when you come later, you can reamp it and or even just for a section and tweak like, it. Yeah, yeah. A different character. If you want to there. calm it down or yeah, you want to change it or open it, you've got this thing and and you can run a diff different version, you know. So it's good for um yeah, just being able to give you a few options. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. And you you chain amps together or anything as well for yeah. larger sounds? Sometimes, or? yeah. We we have a couple of um a couple of amps which we use, you know, the little ads splitters and you can run a yep. few amps off those um a lot of the times it's i don't usually combine amp sounds i won't have two amps and two mics in the same place and combine those you know sure. usually it'll be i have an amp there maybe in one room you know with the, say it's a typical micing thing you have a mic on there and then i have an amp in another room which has a delay sent to it or something and that would be an ambient mic so it's usually combining things that way, you yep. know? And then, yeah, a lot. Uh, another thing we did on the recent Queen's record was had DI guitars as well. We would have like a chain, pedal chain, pretty heavy pedal chain, and that would be a DI. So you'd have this like super thin, oh, in your face thing, and then I'd send another one out to an amp, which would have an ambient mic. So you'd have this contrast of a super yeah, interesting. tight thing, and then a... And amp a full bodied ambience way over there somewhere, yeah. Gives Bizarre. it some depth, you know. So that's kind of an interesting thing to do as well. Yeah, I like that all your techniques rely a lot of ambience, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and natural I ambience. Like you know, building it's not like, the picture, we'll send that to a delay later, or we'll do this, and it's yeah, yeah it's always something in the room, yeah. It's nice, I, really I like, like that, yeah. Uh, 
trying to build that picture as you go, you know. Mm. And hearing what everyone's hearing in the room. Yeah, you know, totally. You've got to yeah. capture that. And that's what you like, just... stand, when you stand in a room with a band playing, you're like, oh, this is frightening. Yeah. You know? And but it's generally, like... you make things like your, your ear right up next to them. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, which is kind of unnatural. So, it, it, yeah, it just seems natural to capture that. Yeah. yeah. And I do, like, yeah, again, going back to drums, I do things like if, you know, like turning the ambient mics, if I have a, if you're in a you know room and the drummer's over there and you have the ambient mics back here, sometimes face them away from the drummer. If it's a fast song, you get that kind of slap. Yeah. And you drive that and you just instantly get this kind of like thunder. Yeah, it's weight back here. Yeah, yeah. And you get, you know, yeah, using uh, rooms, I kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. For... That's great. <laughs> and uh... I think part of that was, again, the exchange, not having effects units. I'll be like... Yeah. How can I do this without that? Yeah, you know? totally. So and you go and put a microphone out. It's one of those things you are just printing it straight to tape. So yeah. you know it's always going exactly. to be there. You've yeah. captured the sound of the record. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and just sort of, uh, it's, it sounds different. You know? Yeah. It's a bit kind of unique. Well, I guess you come to mixing and you just put the faders up. Like, oh, there it is. The fader, yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. That's how I used to make records. Which you're like, how did they do that? It's amazing. Yeah. You know, well, you put the faders up at zero and the, the track's there and you're like, oh my God, they were good. Editing. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot yeah. of that comes from the, you know, the changing of, the industry uh, has yeah. your workflow changed much now with the whole kind of digital revolution so to speak i guess kind of yeah i wasn't like i only started really i've only been doing this job for like 13 years i think now so i was sort of, i started analog but it was very much pro tools at the time you know but i mm. started analog at that time so i don't know it's always been a sort of i've always worked in that fairly diy way albeit kind of in a, with fancy equipment you know but yeah. literally plugging something in and, and and sitting next to vocalists while they're singing you know it's the same as someone in their bedroom doing yeah of course it. just you know possibly a nicer chain or something but so I've always had that approach and for me the difference was going into a proper studio and being like all oh, right I can listen through the speakers and like <laughs> not have to have headphones on you know yeah sure but still I'd still find myself in the I from most of the time moving mics. You just have to run that much further. Yes. Yeah, so go going over to the couple drums, of double doors and go all through that. the double door, through the sound lock, out around the corner, back into you know, yeah. it's that much more work. But yeah, principle still the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose that's what's great is that your first studio was a single room. So yeah, yeah that that's made you very comfortable with the way you're gonna work these days. Yeah, so. yeah, I guess. Yeah. I've sort of always been like that, you know. So I mean now you all the plugins are plugins are so good. And the quality you can get in the computer is great, you know. Yeah, but there are unlimited of them. Like for it's, example, yeah, that's like, the only thing you get all these packages, and you just like open up, you say compressor, and you open up, you just goes whoosh. This list is like this, and you're yeah. like, okay. And it's just, like, like you can run forty six instances of them. It's like there yeah. is a specific amount of rack gear here. Yeah. It's like well, I want four of them. Oh, we only got three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those, exactly. You know? Yeah. Maybe we'll have to try something else. Yeah. Limitations are great. Exactly. You know. I mean. uh David Ringer, when he was over and I met him in uh, in January, he referred to the modern industry as the art of delaying decisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, do you find that when you receive files to mix from someone who's recorded themselves, is it just, you know, like, are you receiving guitar DIs and drum triggers and be like, yeah, yeah, make the record? Yeah, a lot of the time. And sometimes you even get things that where you get, we've recorded it, this is the tape thing and we've recorded it to Pro Tools as well so you get like double files and you're like do you want me to, you want me to play it all or is that what the <laughs> yeah. thing is? Yeah, I don't know there's no rules, you do what you want you know but yeah, making decisions is great, having that limitation yeah exactly yeah starting like, you know if you only have 16 channels thankfully I guess I started out like that so I had to learn that thing where I had 16 channels on Studer on 2 inch, so you get you fill them up and you go and someone would go, we want to do a reverse piano thing here into the chorus. And you go, okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, and then realize that you've got a shaker track maybe on tape that only comes in on the chorus. So you go, okay, there's a bit of space there. So you're going to do a reverse piano here. So you have to like work out where the channel is. You're on channel seven. So what you have to do to reverse thing is like turn the tape upside down. Of course. Which then moves the track down to channel whatever 11 or something so you have to then work out you know without recording yeah. over anything and when it's coming in when it's coming in like, oh we did it in the middle eight instead of verse two <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah 
But yeah, that's a great discipline to learn stuff like that. Yeah. You don't have to do that now. You have to know the track inside out. You have to well. know the track inside out and work so and like, like marker three. Do, yeah, exactly. Yeah, do some maths and, and try and work that out. Yeah, limitations are great for creativity. Yeah. I love like something I do really enjoy when I've been in situations where you go to a small studio if you're working with someone and they have like five mics and a couple of pre's. I love that. Yeah. Because you have to, like, you just get this thing where you have a chain. You're like, right, okay, let's move the mic over there. And then you have to work it a bit to get that. You know, it's like... Yeah. It's, uh, I did a lot of work <clears throat> like that in New Zealand. I would go to uh, holiday houses at the beach and I'd take two Neve Breeze without EQ and yeah. 1176 and a converter. Yeah. It was like, I had a, a Royer, a 57 and a U87. It's like, there's our record. Perfect. Done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, was like, it doesn't sound right. Do you yeah. want ribbon? Oh, or a ribbon. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I one of three. Well, uh, one of each, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Condenser, ribbon, and dynamic. Yeah. Like, there's our options. That's it. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, you know, the lack of equipment isn't, isn't, um, an excuse or a hindrance or a hindrance. Yeah. yeah. I say excuse. I don't mean that in a bad way. It's not a hindrance. It's a good thing, you know. Yeah, of course. Um, I'd rather, I think, I'd rather hear a, an amazing song performed amazingly well, recorded with 357s, mm. than a bad song, you know, recorded well with some, you know, M50s or something, yeah, you know? of course. It's like you Ultimately, over. it's about the song. It's yeah. about the song and the vibe and getting that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got a quote from you, which was, take your best song and make it your worst. Yeah. You care to elaborate on I that? I know. It sounds, I remember saying that and someone going like, what does that mean? You're just going to ruin it. <laughs> But I, yeah, I saw that in a, in a man's wall once. He had all these kind of sayings up, and I mm. noticed that one in particular. And just thinking, oh yeah, that's amazing. It's like you've got a record and you've got the song, the sing, you know, the one. That's great. What you need to do then is elevate every other song to be better than that song. That's the aim, you know. Sure. Just that kind of like, there's no, you know, just raise the game of everything else. Yeah. So that one becomes. Oh, and we've got that one. You know, that was the that was the kind of <laughs> the meaning behind that. Yeah, not brilliant. ruining it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as we dived into a little bit about how the industry has changed a lot, um, not only in the terms of the technology, uh, but the whole music industry. If you were to now in say the 2010s rather than the 90s to be going out buying your first sampler and having your first foray into music, yeah. I mean, how would you approach it now? With the, oh god, I don't know. The digital era. I mean, it's so so much more access is so much easier now. I guess. I mean, I say that if you've got a iPad or something, you can record things on there. You know, there's like there's ways in. Mm. There's like pro, there's a free Pro Tools now. You know, you yeah, can just exactly. download and use. You know, a lot of some people used to use cracked software. You know, in the days gone by, <laughs> you don't have to do that now. It's like it's out there and it's free. You know. So getting it, you can get your hands on it and learn it. Yeah, you've got and access to all the technologies. You've got access to it, I yeah. mean, is it the same thing where you first bought that uh, sampler and it called them up and you're like, it's not working properly? I yeah. mean, would, would you use, I guess the way I'm trying to word it is, I mean, would you still be mailing out to studios to try and get in there? Or would you be trying to build something more off your own back? Or I think, just kind of more advice for those who are getting into yeah, it? Yeah, I think, I think it's great to do your, your own thing. What you've got to do then is like, how do you attract people to it? You know, mm. like, how do you build that up? One of the good things about the traditional route of going through studios is just being in those environments where you come across people who are like making it, you know, like yeah. making hits and like people have, have all this experience and you'll be in there and you would like see these people walking by and you're like, oh, oh and God. what they're doing as well. Yeah. See their techniques be like, that's amazing. Yeah. And just being in that environment is, is really good fuel you know let alone being able to speak to them obviously not hassling people in the studio but um yeah so there's 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 like different aspects to it i guess you can like you love it and and build a studio and it's got you've just got to find a way of getting people in there offering something different or making it that good that people are going to come there or yeah go and um just try and hang out with people who do it whether yeah, that sure. be an internship or it's it's all worthy stuff. It's just experience and, and learning, you know, going mm. going to a studio and offering your services, whether that be cleaning the floor or whatever, just getting in there because you'll learn so much. That exactly. You really don't know how it works. You know, when you come out of college, 
you're like, I'm done. This is it. I learned. But then you go into the studio and you're like, oh, right. Yeah. So much more to learn. This he's is not doing, He's not using any of the techniques I learned. You know, yeah. it's just, it's so open. It's just good to get out there and as much as you can absorb. Yeah, sure. Soak up. And like, yeah, I started in a mastering studio, you know, which was nothing. <laughs> I wasn't recording anything. But learning that final chain it kind of helped me now, you know, to knowing how far you can go. Yeah, of course. What the limitations are that. Yeah, you know where to stop mixing. And yeah, all. basically, yeah. And, and like the problems that occur, the mm. trip up mastering engineers that are just like, oh, they did that. You know, you're like, okay. Yeah, that's why you always need great communication Don't with the mastering that. engineer, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Always bounce ideas. How was the mix? Yeah, How'd exactly. Yeah, yeah. How was it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, kind of uh, just be uh, prepared to learn from people and you know nothing, you know? Yeah, like, of course. Be willing to learn. They know. Be willing to learn. Yeah, it's the best way. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, last question would be, how do you find the tea over here? Being a Brit. <laughs> Have you adapted? I, I've adapted to drinking coffee. Yes. <laughs> I had coffee first thing in the morning now. I can't move without it. It used to be, just to be straight up tea. I would drink like 89 cups of tea a day if it was offered to me constantly, you know. But, yep, thanks, another tea. Yeah. Um, there are tea bags you can get in America. That's not uh, that's not that much of a problem anymore. There's decent tea bags. Um, not many places have kettles. You find when yeah. you first come here, you'll be in a hotel. You'll be like, "What's the kettle?" Yeah, of course. I've, I've actually noticed that. There's like there's a yeah. coffee machine. You're like, "Ah, uh, kettle." I'm trying to get some hot water out of yeah, the coffee machine. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Does it work if I don't put coffee in? Just adapt. You know, go uh, do as the Romans is what they say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> do as Romans when in Rome, say. adapt. Yeah, yeah, coffee. Oh, perfect. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, should we put one on? have a cup of coffee, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for this. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you again on recordproduction.com. <laughs> Fantastic. Cheers. Thanks.